Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It's Monday, April 28th, 2014, and here are our top stories. Tonight, bankers' biggest secrets have now gone mainstream. Then, a mysterious plane returns to Russia for the fourth straight day. And how taxpayers fund decadent sports owners. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. In Hollywood, you drive into a big gate with armed guards, and then there'll be another gate in a neighborhood. You get into another gate, and then there'll be another gate on that house, and then a security office. Well, to underscore just how high tensions are in the Ukraine with Russia, Paul Joseph Watson writes that the Russian doomsday plane has been active now for a fourth consecutive day. This is Russia's Tupolev Tu T-14 SR, Moscow's version of the US E-4B, has been flying for the fourth consecutive day. It illustrates how Ukraine is descending into civil war. Now, this is a plane that typically shadows Putin. And as he points out, they may be using it as a decoy. But still, the fact that it's in the air for four days shows that they're concerned to either hide his presence or to protect wherever he is. Now, of course, this is a conflict that InfoWars has pointed out many times is being pushed by the IMF, by bankers, by financiers like George Soros. We don't want the bankers creating another war. But it's interesting that the mainstream financial press is waking up to the fact and criticizing the fact that the bankers are not just creating wars, but creating money. This is an article from Washington's blog. It's the biggest secret about banking has just gone mainstream. He points out that They've proven now that loans come first and then deposits follow. And this is really from the Financial Times' Martin Wolf, one of the world's most influential mainstream financial writers, as he points out. He says that banks create money out of thin air, and because they do, they should be stripped out of this power and limited to normal depository functions. Here's what Wolf said in the story. He said, printing counterfeit banknotes is illegal. But creating private money is not. And this is a source of instability in our markets. And then he underscores it with this quote. This giant hole at the heart of our market economies needs to be plugged. Now, this was also picked up by Business Insider. And the article there is ban all the banks. Here's the wild idea that people are starting to take seriously. And he points out that essentially the modern banking system represents the outsourcing of money creation from the federal government to the banking system. And again, he quotes economist uh, Martin Wolf, who calls for stripping the banks of their right to create money. He says that since they're creating this money ex nihilo, they're responsible for destabilizing credit bubbles and for creating busts. And he says, if the government is going to have to end up backstopping everything as it currently is, why not just have the government be the source of money creation? And finally, they go back to a 1939 proposal from a very famous economist, Irving Fisher, who was analyzing what could be done in the wake of the Great Depression. And here's what he said in his paper. He said, the chief loose screw in our present American money banking system is a requirement of only fractional reserves behind demand deposits. Finally, they look at this article and they ask, what can be done? Will this happen? And again, they go back to a quote from Martin Wolf, and he says, this will not happen now. But remember the possibility when the next crisis comes, and it surely will. We need to be ready. Take that as a warning if you're a banker. Now, we know where the, that they're creating the money. Who gets this money? Well, we give the money, in many cases, to welfare professional sports team owners. And, of course, one of them has been in the news quite a lot lately. This is a guy who is a bona fide racist, who is a bona fide welfare recipient. Compare him to Cliven Bundy, the guy that they took his, the New York Times, took his contents out of context and severely edited them to try to make him look like a racist. This guy, Donald Sterling, really is a racist, and he really is a welfare queen. This guy is getting over 233 times the amount of money that Cliven Bundy is accused of not paying in his grazing rights dispute with the BLM. And of course, this money is just given to him. Look at what he got. In 1999, this is an article that was put out, Bear Stearns financed this and announced that the transaction when they created the Staples Center, where Don Sterling's team is now playing, they said this transaction was the largest ever financing for a professional sports arena. He got $70 million. This is where the money goes. Now, of course, this guy who's going to be honored by the NAACP as the Lifetime Achievement Award the same group was going to give Reverend Al Sharpton 
a person of the year award. Here's this guy who was a drug dealer for the mafia. He was a made man inside the mafia. Then he becomes an FBI snitch. And of course, he's the person of the year. And then the person who's going to get the lifetime achievement is the guy who is running his welfare sports team as if he was a plantation owner with the same attitude, the same racist attitude. Understand that professional sports players, first they go through the college system, of course, they get paid nothing, even though coaches and universities are making millions off of this. Then they have a situation where they're treated as chattel, being traded from place to place. And then finally, they get kicked to the curb when their short career of fame and fortune is over. And this is the group of people that this professional sports team owner who gets millions of dollars, and of course, $70 million was a lot back in 1999, but of course now they get hundreds of millions of dollars, getting approaching close to a billion dollars in welfare for these wealthy sports team owners. But you know, he's not the only one. Look at Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example. Here's a guy that the Simon Wiesenthal Center was going to give an award to, even though he had clear Nazi connections. They said he may be the son of a Nazi, but Arnold will get a Jewish award. Now this is from the LA Times back when he was getting this honor, and they point out that even though there was an unauthorized biography that reported a lot of connections between him and his father, and of course his father was a Nazi in Austria, he volunteered for the SA and was an officer in the SA. And of course there were reports in 1992 from Spy Magazine that Arnold enjoyed playing and giving away records of Hitler's speeches. He thought that Hitler was a great man and made those comments on film reportedly and the pumping iron documentary. Of course, they did not use that in the final version. And then he said, I didn't think about money. I thought about fame, about just being the greatest. I was dreaming about being some dictator. Well, you know, Arnold, if you wanna be a dictator, probably the best place to be is in American politics because it seems like that's, <laughs> that's where everybody is acting like a dictator, but it's not just him. It's our current dictator in chief again. Obama winning the Nobel Peace Prize. Look at that. Scorsese has absolutely no reason to win the Peace Prize. Look at when he first took office, and this is a story from the Huffington Post. They said, the announcement drew gasps of surprise and cries of too much, too soon. Yet President Barack Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize because the judges found his promise, his promise of disarmament and diplomacy just too good to ignore. So how's that promise working out for you now? Obama, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, is now the drone assassin. And of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Nazi sympathizer, gets awards from the Jews. And then we've got a guy who runs a plantation system for his professional sports team and holds the people there in utter racist contempt. And of course, he was going to get the person of the year. Fortunately, the NAACP has now taken that back. But what do you get? Well, you get singled out for <laughs> loaded weapons in your face when an automatic license plate reader misreads your tag. Look at this story from Tim Cushing at Tech Dirt. Cops draw weapons on driver after license plate reader misreads his plate. Now, according to the Prairie Village Post, earlier this month, lawyer Mark Molner was driving through a Kansas City suburb on his way home from his wife's sonogram. That's right, a pregnant wife who sees this from a parked car nearby. All of a sudden, his BMW is blocked in front by a police car as another officer in a motorcycle pulls up behind him. He said, he did not point the weapon at me, but he definitely had his gun out of his holster. I'm guessing that he saw the shock and the horror on my face and realized that I was unlikely to make more of a scene. Well, what they did was the automatic license plate reader read a seven instead of a two, and it returned it as a stolen vehicle. And of course, they doubled down and said that if he was 100% sure the officer would have been able to conduct a felony car stop, which means that both officers would have been pointing guns at him while they gave him commands to exit the vehicle. This sounds just like Terry Gilliam's Brazil, where they mistake Buttle for Tuttle and a guy gets a full-on SWAT team raid. But this is what we have always warned about. When they start using this universal surveillance and start triggering things, just like they did with this automatic license plate reader, they're going to be looking at people who maybe are bending down to change a tire, and that might look very much like somebody's trying to steal a car. And we know that since the police are so trigger happy and are so quick to shoot first, this is going to cost innocent lives unless we change the rules of engagement. And there's no better example of that than this story from the Mail Online, which is talking about an officer in Knoxville, Tennessee. A Tennessee sheriff's deputy is fired 
after he was caught on camera choking an unresisting college student until he passed out. Now, fortunately, he was fired, but this is really amazing. Look at these pictures. This student, this college student, has his, now, of course, he was accused of having a cup that smelled like it had alcohol. And there were a lot of college students that were very unruly that were throwing things at the cops, so it got the cops' blood up. But look what they did. They've got him handcuffed behind his back, and this cop in front, the one, that's the one they, that you see right there, he's the one that was fired. He is choking this guy unconscious. The guy is offering absolutely no resistance. The other two officers are just as guilty. They're standing by, holding his arms behind his back where he's handcuffed. This is what we're seeing all the time. This is what we were really concerned about at the Bundy Ranch. This is why it became a national story, why Paul Joseph Watson picked it up. The details are very complicated. We believe, I believe certainly, that Bundy has a very good legal case on some issues. It brings up a lot of very good points that need to be looked at in terms of the jurisdiction between the state and federal government, in terms of what's going to happen with Agenda 21 and endangered species. But the key thing here, the key thing, was a bureaucracy that was over the top, using snipers to point weapons at unarmed people, setting up free speech areas where they censored anybody complaining about this, and attacking people who crossed their lines. This is what we have to contend with. And we have coming up at the end of the program, Ron Paul pointing out that this was exactly what was going to happen back in 1997. But before we get there, let's look at another aspect that has surfaced from this Nevada ranch standoff. And that, of course, is Harry Reid's corruption and ethics issues. And that's an issue that is not going away. A new probe, this is reported by The New American, a new probe confirms Harry Reid's long history of corruption. This is a two-part investigation that was done by Real Clear Politics. This is now being reported by The New American. We have reported many different instances, and they point out that he arrived, Harry Reid did, arrived in Washington in 1983 as the only congressman from Nevada. And at that time, he only had a net worth of about a million dollars, and now it's easily over $10 million. And of course, they don't have that exactly because the land, he's heavily invested in real estate, <laughs> like 90% of it he looks at as if it were his personal fiefdom that he can broker to globalist capitalists, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm not even talking about the tips that they give him. I'm talking about the massive amount of real estate that he's got there, which, of course, varies in value depending on what Harry Reid does. And the article continues and says he has built a dizzying network of mutually beneficial political, personal, and business alliances. And these associations benefit Reid, his family, his close friends, and very often the state. A lot of people are going to be looking at these alliances and associations and what it means to Harry Reid, to his son Rory Reid to his hand-picked director for the BLM, Neil Kornza, and Kornza's father, who is connected on many of the largest mining companies' board of directors. We're going to be following this story, and there are a lot of other people who are now following Dirty Harry's connections. Now, the question in Nevada, as in many other places, is out west, does the Constitution allow for the federal government to retain ownership of, in the case of Nevada, 90% of federal land after it moves from a territory to a state? You know, does the Constitution even matter to the American public, to the government for that, for that matter? Well, right after the break, Joe Biggs is going to be asking people on the street what they think about the Constitution. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. From the water table to our soils to the atmosphere itself, our world is becoming more and more toxic each and every day. But it's not just the air outside that's toxic. Indoor air has been shown to have two to five times higher concentrations of pollutants than even outdoor air. And most Americans spend 90% of their time inside using toxic chemicals within their homes. There are more than 42 million smokers in the United States. Well over a thousand types of mold and mildew linked to numerous conditions. And don't forget the fact that six million Americans live with pets they're allergic to as well. When I began to research these statistics, it was clear to me it was time to start cleansing my lungs in order to combat the toxic environment that we cannot escape but that we can fight back against. Made with organic and wild cultivated herbs and manufactured in the USA, the new InfoWars Life Lung Cleanse is here in a convenient spray bottle that can be brought with you throughout any toxic environment. Now available exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139.
A chemical spill contaminating the water supply in nine West Virginia counties. This year alone, over 300,000 people in West Virginia had their drinking water contaminated. What are the health effects of having these drugs in our drinking water? It's forced medical treatment without the consent of residents. My friends, water filtration is one of the most basic actions you can take to protect you and your family from the harmful toxins and heavy metals in your tap water. On average, the county says it sprays with the glyphosate at least once a week. Few filters cut out the glyphosate that is found in water supplies worldwide. Remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, hydrofluorosilicic acid, sodium hexafluorosilicate. Fluoride it is in tea, it's in coffee, it's in water, it's in bread, it's in toothpaste. It is our responsibility to protect our families. The establishment's not going to do it. It's time to take action. It's time to filter our water. For a limited time, use the promo code WATER15 and get 15% off on all ProPure systems at InfoWarsStore.com or call toll-free 888-253-3139. Today we're out here on the streets asking people why they think the Constitution's outdated and whether or not we should take away or add to. Let's see what they have to say. I don't know a lot about this stuff. I really don't. I should. Well, you should know about that. I mean, you this is we share this. we share this country. <laughs> I know. You know, you're we right. should we should all be proud Americans. We should all know these things. You know. You're right. I know. Come on. I need to learn more about it. I'm sorry. Yeah, you do. <laughs> No, it's not out there. I can't even think of any right now, but I know that some of it is because it needs to be re-looked at. A lot of it, uh, the gun rights, I think, need to be changed. I think it's not an outdated document. People have to follow it more. What do you think about the right to privacy? Oh, well, they definitely overstepped their bounds on that one. With the NSA? Yeah, definitely. How does that make you feel? Like I'm being watched all the time. Doesn't make you feel too good, does it? No, I don't, I don't like it at all. I'm just kind of busy, so I, I, I haven't been really able to think about it. So I'm just kind of going to school and whatnot, so. Well, when the Constitution was written, it was written to protect the public. There were a couple of things in there, like the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. That has been distorted. It was in order to protect the pioneers from the British invasions, and they had to have guns to hunt. They didn't have supermarkets like we do today. And that was the reason they had the right to bear arms. So you think we should completely revise the Second Amendment? Do you think we should just get rid of it completely? Well, the Second Amendment has something in it that is very important. I think that if uh, you are in a situation where you need to bear arms, yes. What that situation would encompass, I can't say. But in general, the public should not be allowed to have guns. I don't think you should rewrite that. You should just get rid of all the politicians that are making the decisions right now. All the old cronies. Yeah. Let's get a whole new group in there. That Supreme Court guy that wants to change is about 90, about 190 years old, isn't he? Do you think we should add anything to the Constitution or take away anything at all, like the free freedom not, of speech, right all. to privacy? Not, not at all. Not at all. Do you think it's okay that the NSA completely violates that right there, our, our right to privacy? Um, that it it's debatable if they do or they don't. I mean, so they say it's for our own good. I don't if that's what they say, but I mean, <laughs> who knows? You know, as an American, though, you don't feel like you've been violated, though. You know, we give them all this power I, and this I, trust. I, th I think the government violates us every day. I, I can't understand. Uh, I don't know. Like, I go to school here, but I'm from Colombia, and I live, my whole family lives in Colombia, so I really... Well, you're here. You should care about it. It affects no, I you. Know, I do care about it. The thing is, like, I don't feel educated enough to say, like, I completely support this. We are living in a world right now that's terror-ridden. Uh, it's got a lot of problems, murders, robberies. But that's I mean, always been going on. Yes, but the pop. The only reason is, though, is the social media. Now you just have more viewing of it. And I think that's wrong, too, because there's a lot of copycat uh, uh, crimes going on, all right? Uh, school shootings, they publicize it. Why? Somebody says, hey, that's a good idea. I'll do that, too. Things like that are wrong. The media has to stop publicizing crime, and they're doing that. So so you don't agree with the First Amendment, the freedom of speech, then, no, the freedom for press? Do. I absolutely do. Are you just saying it should be monitored? Absolutely. As you can see, there's a lot of varying opinions about the Constitution. Some people know, some people don't, and some people flat out just don't care.
friends, Alex Jones here to tell you about some of the most important information concerning you and your family's health. Radiation levels have more than doubled in the last 60 years in the Northern Hemisphere from all of the nuclear testing and radiological accidents. Radioactive contamination is now in most of the food supply. There's only two ways to avoid this. Move south of the equator or properly protect your thyroid with nascent iodine. Looking to protect my family, I've done deep research. Nascent iodine is the purest, cleanest, absolute best form of iodine to protect yourself and your family. It's made right here in the USA, completely non-GMO. I searched out the best quality and now have developed a double strength form of nascent iodine exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Nascent iodine is on record as one of the only safe ways to detox from fluoride poisoning. Survival Shield Nascent Iodine. Secure your super high quality nascent iodine today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. Hi, I'm Shane Steiner. A lot of you have been following my progress using Super Male Vitality. The last 19 weeks has been an incredible experience. I was feeling a little down and lethargic during the holidays, and none of the supplements that I was taking were doing any good. That's when my longtime friend from high school, Alex Jones, introduced me to Super Male Vitality. I was a little skeptical at first. Not only would I have the energy to work out and go to the gym, but it, it was actually the changes were happening to my body. Uh, a lot more rapidly. My whole mood, my libido, everything had completely changed. The concentrated organic herbs, they stimulate your natural systems to produce the natural hormones that you need. I just really wanted to, to bulk up and hit it hard and I went in for about the first five weeks and was lifting heavy weight and just really hitting it hard and I gained 20 pounds of muscle immediately. Since that, I've decided I was gonna lose some weight and slim down. I just changed up my workout a little bit and 35 pounds came off. Folks, this is not a joke. This is not a gimmick, it's real. Super Male Vitality, available at InfoWarsLife.com. Welcome back. Now, there's many aspects to the Nevada Bundy Ranch standoff, but the one that drew our attention, the one that made it a national story, was the iron-fisted tyranny of the BLM. Now, going back to 1997, a video resurfaced today from Ron Paul where he was warning about arming the BLM. And of course, not just the BLM, but many bureaucracies. Now, he said, what we're going to get is a growing army of bureaucrats, armed regulators prowling the states where they have no authority. Exactly right. Steve Stockman, congressman from Texas, sent the U.S. code to the Secretary of the Interior and said, if you have to use armed force, you need to contract with local legitimate law enforcement. That is the federal law, which they ignored. Of course, they ignored the Constitution, imposed free speech zones, that sort of thing. Remember that the founders said that where the, the people fear the government, there is tyranny. What I saw there was a government that was very much afraid of the people. As they pointed their weapons at those of us in the crowd, virtually all of us were unarmed. Guns were nearby. We were not pointing guns at them. They were pointing guns at us and threatening to shoot. And I saw the fear in their eyes as they backed down. We have to disarm the bureaucracy. Ron Paul warned about this in 1997. It's more than twice as large of a standing army that we have today. And he also warned that there was never any authority for a federal police force that even the FBI was not tolerated in America until the 20th century. Here's what he had to say. Mr. Speaker, earlier this year, another member severely criticized me on the House floor for declaring on C-SPAN that indeed many Americans justifiably feared their own government. This fear has come from the police state mentality that prompted Ruby Ridge, Waco, and many other episodes of an errant federal government. Under the Constitution, there was never meant to be a federal police force. Even an FBI limited only to investigations was not accepted until this century. Yet today, fueled by the federal government's misdirected war on drugs, Radical environmentalism and the aggressive behavior of the nanny state, we have witnessed the massive buildup of a virtual army of armed regulators prowling the states where they have no legal authority. The sacrifice of individual responsibility and the concept of local government by the majority of American citizens has permitted the army of bureauc bureaucrats to thrive. 
We have depended on government for so much for so long that we as a people have become less vigilant of our liberties. And as long as the government provides largesse for the majority, the special interest lobbyists will succeed in continuing the redistribution of welfare programs that occupies most of Congress's legislative time. Wealth is limited, yet demands are unlimited. A welfare system inevitably diminishes production and shrinks the economic pie. As this occurs, anger among the competing special interests grows. While Congress and the people concentrate on material welfare and its equal redistribution, the principles of liberty are ignored and freedom is undermined. And more immediate, the enforcement of the interventionist state requires a growing army of bureaucrats. Since groups demanding special favors from the federal government must abuse the rights and property of those who produce wealth and cherish liberty, real resentment is directed at the agents who come to eat out our substance. The natural consequence is for the intruders to arm themselves to protect against angry victims of government intrusion. Thanks to a recent article by Joseph Farah, director of the Western Journalism Center of Sacramento, California, appearing in the Houston Chronicle, the surge in the number of armed federal bureaucrats have been brought to our attention. Farah points out that in 1996 alone, at least 2,439 new federal cops were authorized to carry firearms. That takes the total up to nearly 60,000. Farah points out that these cops were not only in agencies like the FBI, but include the EPA, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Army Corps of Engineers. Even Bruce Babbitt, according to Farah, wants to arm the Bureau of Land Management. Farah logically asks, when will the NEA have its armed art cops? This is a dangerous trend. It's ironic that the proliferation of guns in the hands of the bureaucrats is pushed by the anti-gun fanatics who hate the Second Amendment and would disarm every law-abiding American citizen. Yes, we need gun control. We need to disarm our bureaucrats, then abolish the agencies. If government bureaucrats like guns that much, let them seek work with the NRA. Force and intimidation are the tools of tyrants. Intimidation with government guns and the threat of imprisonment and the fear of harassment by government agents put fear into the hearts of millions of Americans. Four days after Paula Jones refused a settlement in her celebrated suit, she received notice that she and her husband would be audited for 1995 taxes. Since 1994 is the current audit year for the IRS, the administration's denial that the audit is related to the suit is suspect, to say the least. Even if it is coincidental, don't try to convince the American people. Most Americans, justifiably cynical and untrusting toward the federal government, know the existence, the evidence exists that since the 1970s, both Republican and Democratic administrations have not hesitated to intimidate their political enemies with IRS audits and regulatory harassment. Even though the average IRS agent doesn't carry a gun, the threat of incarceration and seizure of property is backed up by many guns. All government power is ultimately gun power and serves the interests of those who despise or do not comprehend the principles of liberty. The gun in the hands of law-abiding citizens serve to hold in check arrogant and aggressive government. Guns in the hands of the bureaucrats do the opposite. The founders of this country fully understood this fact, and I yield back. Well, that's it for tonight's nightly news. Join us again tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Celebrate the spirit of freedom and liberty upon which our nation was founded at InfoWarsShop.com. Molon Lave is ancient Greek for come and take it. This popular design combines both classic Greek Spartan imagery with modern M16 assault rifles. Now available in women's tees and proudly made in the USA. Celebrate the spirit of 1776 with the George Washington brass belt buckle or this incredibly sharp looking 1776 hat. Badass. 
And be sure to check out the new arrivals at InfoWars Life, where you can prepare your body to perform at peak levels with Survival Shield Nascent Iodine, Super Male Vitality, and Fluoride Shield. And Wake Up America, Immune Support Blend is the healthy choice for the gourmet coffee lover. So get incredibly high-quality freedom-based products and help fund the revolution at InfoWarsShop.com. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. Members can share their passcodes with up to 11 other people, and your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.